After 200 years of British rule over the Indian subcontinent, on August 15, 1947, it was split into two independent nations, Hindu-majority India and Muslim-majority Pakistan. The process was known as partition. Most people wanted independence, but what came after that was tragic. Some 17 million people were displaced and an estimated 1 million were killed. Prior to colonization, the subcontinent was made up of princely states where many religions coexisted. Hindus were the majority and Muslims were the largest minority. Historians say the British implemented a strategy known as divide and rule, promoting political divisions between followers of the region's main religions. But a freedom movement, mainly led by the Indian National Congress Party, saw members of these communities come together to resist British rule. Led by Mahatma Gandhi and others, the largely non-violent campaign forced the British to act, and the UK announced its plans to quit the vast nation after the Second World War. But that ignited fears about who would govern next. Making up 25% of the population, Muslims were worried about being a minority in a Hindu-majority country. Under imperial rule, they were protected and represented in a specialized system. So, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, leader of the Muslim League, advocated for Muslims to have their own homeland, Pakistan. A section of Hindus also campaigned for an ethnic Hindu state. Divisions between the two groups deepened. Riots erupted in many places in which thousands were killed. In 1946, Lord Louis Mountbatten, the new British Viceroy to India, started talks with the Congress parties Jawaharlal Nehru and Jinnah. Mountbatten convinced the leaders to agree to the partition, creating two new states. Cyril Radcliffe, a British lawyer who had never been to India, was tasked with drawing up the borders. He was given just 36 days to put together the partition project. Using outdated maps and census records, his committee came up with this. India, West Pakistan, and East Pakistan, which would later become Bangladesh. But they didn't assign Muslim-majority Kashmir to either country. This will cause problems later. As the British left in 1947, chaos erupted. Millions of Muslims, Hindus, and Sikhs suddenly found themselves on the wrong side of the border. They had to leave their ancestral homes, with millions of families separated until this day. The exodus of people triggered unprecedented violence, with mobs killing an estimated 1 million people and raping and abducting up to 100,000 women. What was supposed to be a celebration of independence from British rule turned into a bloody and brutal chapter in the history of the two countries. 75 years later, India and Pakistan remain bitter rivals, still disputing over their borders. There have been three wars over the Himalayan territory of Kashmir, which both countries claim as their own. On the Indian side, security forces are fighting rebels opposed to Indian rule. Meanwhile, India's Muslims are regularly subjected to attacks by Hindu groups, emboldened by the nationalist BJP government in power since 2014. The legacy of partition is complex and still felt in South Asia today. A little short there of being there, of course, on the partition of India, which, of course, affected India today on uh, the way it is, and, of course, also why Pakistan also exists today. So, hey, welcome back, of course, Daniel Simon at BRCC. Uh, hope everybody had a great Mardi Gras holiday, had a bunch of days off, of course, uh, going into this week, which is, of course, a short week. Uh, of course, only had one lecture planned uh, for this week, which I'll be, of course, starting to talk about ancient India uh, this week and into also uh, next week as well. So anyway, looks like I got a bunch of students that are watching live right now. Uh, looks like Sierra, Trigal, looks like Sierra, what's going on this morning? Uh, this morning, we had a great Mardi Gras. Looks like Tristan's also joining us as well. Uh, Amanda, hey, what's up, Amanda? Uh, and it looks like Marissa is also joining us along with Avril also as well. So yeah, I hope everybody had a great uh, Mardi Gras of uh, course, out there, I did a few things I did, you know, over the over the break, you know. So, uh, looks like also Christian Watts is also joining us uh, as as well. So, uh, before I get started, I'll just kind of talk about a few uh, reminders, like I always do uh, every week. Uh, I know we have um, two assignments that are out 
right now. Uh, the main one y'all need to kind of wrap up, of course, is the first exam. It is still open, but I think that's going to close. I want to say Friday. I think it's going to be a few more days left on it. Uh, so if you haven't done that yet, you need to do that that assessment, of course, which was mostly just on the Egyptians. Then, of course, I do have that other uh, assignment, of course, on the Phoenicians, Israelites uh, lectures I had uh, from the previous week, last week. Uh, so that's one y'all should be working on pretty much. And if you have, you didn't do the vocab at first vocab, or you didn't do it correctly, which I think was a bunch of students that didn't do it correctly, uh, you know, make sure you you know upload a correct correct assignment, of course, for that that particular. Uh, vocab assignment because there is a new one I know I've got posted uh, I think I want to say a week or so ago and that will be due later uh, next month so anyway just kind of talking about various assignments that are out there of course right now so yeah let me get to of course the main thing today I'll talk about of course I'll have like a two-part lecture series uh, on ancient India uh, this one's going to mostly just go into the background of ancient India I'll talk about like a lot, of, a lot of the geography of India, uh, its early history. I'll also talk about the background of, of Hinduism. We'll kind of get to that, like what Hinduism is. Uh, I'll get more into it, I think, next week, too, talking about more into, like, the gods and all that stuff. And then, of course, it does bring in the caste system uh, as well. So uh, if you do have any comments, questions during the live stream, you know, let me know. Of course, you can always leave comments uh, either on my channel or don't forget, you can also leave comments, questions uh, in Canvas discussions for students uh, as as well. So, uh, yeah, uh, let me go ahead and I'll, I'll first talk about some back. Of course, that temple back there is kind of famous. Uh, that is a, a temple to Lord Siva. It's located in southern southern uh, uh, India. I think it's called the Brihadisvara Temple. Uh, it was built about 1,000 CE, so about 3,000 uh, years ago. So Hinduism, I'll get to that later, traditionally is one of the main religions uh, of, of the Republic of India, of course, now. I think 80% of most people in India are Hindus, of course, I'll get to. But um, but let me talk about the background of India first. I want to discuss, uh, kind of get in, in in what the background of India, the history of it, uh, and all that. Um, well, India itself, uh, a lot of people, uh, you know, going back to like in the subcontinent of India, as they sometimes call it, lived in India. People lived there a long time ago. You can go back, I want to say, I think it's like 50,000, 50, 60,000 years ago, you already had people living there, like going back to, I guess, what would be Paleolithic times. But in India uh, itself, like, I guess during Neolithic times, farming started about close to seven to 8,000 years ago, uh, they think. Uh, and um, it is the second oldest of the River Valley civilizations. I think I told you that Mesopotamia, where, where ancient, ancient Iraq is, of course, uh, that was the oldest one. We've also talked about, you know, Egypt, which is the fourth oldest. I haven't got to China yet, which I'll try to start on maybe next week uh, also as well, which is, I think, the third oldest uh, overall. Uh, this one was based in two river valleys, of course, which are the Indus uh, and, and the Gan Ganga or Ganges river valleys. Uh, and um, kind of show you a map, of course, of India on the right. Uh, you can see it's like a kind of a diamond-shaped peninsula is mostly where uh, ancient India was a long time ago. That would be now uh, what we call uh, Southern Asia or South Asia would be about the location of it. So it's kind of situated between Afghanistan uh, and like Iran to the west and then to the north, China, to the south, the Indian Ocean. And then to the east, you've got Burma and Southeast Asia. That's kind of the location of where it is. But you can see Arabian Sea is kind of to the west of it, Bay of Bengal to the east of it with the Indian Ocean, of course, on the bottom. And of course, I'll get to it later. They often call it the subcontinent or Indian subcontinent is kind of kind of what they call it. Um, and uh, I'll, I'm mostly going to be talking about ancient India, which ancient India kind of goes from like prehistoric times up to like around maybe 500 CE when the Gupta Empire collapsed uh, in the so-called Golden Age of India. So that's mostly the historical periods I'll kind of be talking about uh, in India, which 
dates back several thousand years uh, in in history. But ancient India itself uh, is located. Really, all these countries would kind of be in it today. Uh, so Afghanistan, yeah, believe it or not, Afghanistan, like part of it uh, was at one point uh, in what would be ancient India, maybe the eastern part of Afghanistan. Sri Lanka, it's that island nation off the coast uh, of India, uh, originally called Ceylon. Uh, Bhutan also is included. Bangladesh, of course, the Republic of India, of course, main main country there today, uh, which is sometimes called Bharat or Bharata. I think is a kind of a name they call it too. Uh, Nepal. Uh, and then Pakistan also, of course, which broke away uh, from India. So that, that's the location of mostly where they were. Uh, they, you can see in that map, there's like three main rivers they have. Uh, Indus, which is mostly in Pakistan, uh, which is sometimes called the Sindhu. It's also dubbed that uh, as well. And then um, if you want the names, I'll put them on the screen. Uh, but the Sindhu or Indus, that's kind of where you get the word Indian, Hindu, uh, kind of derived from those names uh, over time. So but that, that river is located in Pakistan in northern India. Ganges is also called the Ganga sometimes as well. Uh, is in kind of like northern eastern India uh, and also Bangladesh. They do have another major river called the Brahmaputra, uh, which is starts up in China, goes down in through like the northeastern part of India, and it empties out uh, close to where uh, the Gang Ganges River is into Bangladesh uh, as well. So those are your major rivers. Although they say uh, the Indus River is more important because that's where a lot of civilizations first started uh, ancient India uh, a long time ago. Uh, here's also, that, of course, New Delhi, you know, is the capital of the Republic of India today. Uh, which, you know, India is a highly populated country uh, overall. You see the Indian flag on the bottom, but population-wise, it is one of the largest populated countries in the world. I think it's like 1.3 billion is amount of people that live there uh, today. You can see more physical geography of India. I'll talk about the mountains that are kind of around it later uh, but I'll talk about I'll, I'll talk about the Indo-Gangetic Plain later, Deccan Plateau. Uh, those are other parts of India that make up the geography uh, of India. But you can see it's very famous for its peninsula shape, that diamond shape that's to it. Of course, uh, that's in South Asia. I uh, kind of give you an idea of the size of India. Uh, like I you know in America, we kind of. Four countries, kind of one of the most populated in the world, too, top five, I think. But uh, India's uh, square mileage is about 1.2 million square miles uh, in size. Uh, United States is about three times that. Uh, so, kind of give you an idea of the size of India uh, inside the United States, of how big it is. Uh, but you can kind of get a comparison uh, of the two different different, you know, countries, but their population is like, you know, like three times or three to four times larger than, of course, our, our population uh, that we have in comparison. So, yeah, you can hear, of course, uh, world's most populous state. Yeah, the United States is one of the top five uh, most populous countries in the world, but you can see India, uh, India right now is the second most populous behind China, but they do think by 2050 uh, that India is going to surpass China. So India is going to be like, by 2050, it's 1.3 billion now, but they think it's going to be like 1.6 billion uh, by 2050. Then China is actually, uh, they think uh, it's going to decline. Like their birth rate is actually declining in China, you know, about that. Uh, and so, uh, you can see the other countries, too, like Nigeria. Look at Nigeria. They think Nigeria is going to explode on population. Kind of give you an idea. The United States, Indonesia, most people don't think about that, but Indonesia is a pretty populated country uh, as well. So, yeah, very popular. There's a lot of people guess, going to work, I guess, uh, getting on a train. <laughs> kind of give you an idea. So some parts of India are like that, like in the cities. 
Uh, yeah, they have different languages that are spoken. In, in, they do speak English. Some people know English, of course, in India because of the British that were there a long time ago. But the traditional uh, most uh, spoken language is Hindi that you know about, of course, which see 534 million uh, speak Hindi. Uh, after that, Bengali, of course, is another uh, dialect that's also spoken, especially like in the eastern part and around where Bangladesh uh, is uh, also, which a lot of these languages are kind of derived back to Sanskrit, which I'll kind of talk about later. But yeah, here we go. Uh, of course, the, get a little bit about the history of Hindi. Uh, they do think that uh, if you know much about India, it's, it was controlled by the British for a long time, uh, Indian subcontinent, like going back like 300 something years, like going back like the 18th century, uh, the British controlled it at one point. Uh, it was later dubbed the uh, British Raj, uh, they called it. Uh, and so that area where Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, even Burma, you know, at one point uh, was controlled uh, by the British uh, going back uh, many years. Uh, and uh, if you know what happened, they had this thing called the Partition of India that happened in 1947, where British India was broken up uh, into different states. Part of it was because of the decolonization of the British Empire that took place after World War II. Uh, that was one of the main reasons, because the British Empire was declining after the war. Uh, and then also, uh, a lot of the people in India, like Hindus especially, wanted to kick the British out because they had been there too long. And uh, also, it created a lot of conflict between uh, the British uh, and native Indians that were there. And you can see here, here's kind of the partition that took place uh, in 1947, which a lot of it was uh, due especially to the different religions because of, you know, you got majority, 80%, around 80% of India was, you know, mostly Hindu and the rest was Muslim. And so 1947 it led to this uh, breakup of India uh, where uh, you, you formed different states, uh, which you can see there, Pakistan and Bangladesh, you see there, which formed afterwards, uh, were mostly majority Muslim countries uh, that would form afterwards. And then Nepal, India, right there, you see in the middle, uh, would be majority Hindu uh, that would form afterwards. India also controlled that area that's kind of like between China and Bangladesh, you see that part in the northeastern corner. Uh, next to Myanmar, which used to be called Burma. Uh, so they also controlled that uh, as well. But they had that dispute, you know, up in Kashmir, like up in the northern part of India where Pakistan meets. And so that's kind of the conflict they have today, of course, still. Uh, of course, part of why they broke up was because of Mahatma Gandhi. I think everybody's heard about Gandhi, of course. And Gandhi was this famous Indian uh, revolutionary that wanted to throw the British out, uh, he was an anti-colonialist, uh, and uh, Gandhi used a lot of non-violent methods to basically do this uh, throughout India, which worked, uh, and uh, it influenced other people, too. Uh, if you know about Martin Luther King Jr., like in the United States, he was heavily influenced by Gandhi. You probably know that. Uh, and so he influenced a lot of people to, I guess, revolt against uh, you know, other establishments. So that was Gandhi. Sad thing, he was assassinated right afterwards. Probably would have been the first ruler or prime minister afterwards, most likely, but uh, he was, of course, killed right after they broke up uh, into independent India. Uh, so yeah, going back to the subcontinent, why do they call it the Indian subcontinent? Well, if you know about it, it's kind of like the subdivided part of Asia uh, that's broken up, uh, mostly because of different uh, tectonic plates. Uh, that rub against each other. Uh, and uh, the southern part is the Indian plate. That's like India uh, and part of the Indian Ocean, uh, which is below it. Uh, and then above, they got the so-called uh, Eurasian plate that's kind of hitting it. And so uh, with those two plates running into running into each other, uh, it's creating like the Himalayas, uh, the Tibetan mountain highlands, which are kind of above it uh, as well. And so it's kind of like this physiographical region <clears throat> that's separated from the rest of Asia, especially with mountains like above it. And the mountains were kind of important. The mountains kind of, you know, allowed India to become a separate culture 
uh, compared to the rest of Asia. And uh, if you know about the mountains like the Himalayas, you see here in that image, the Himalayas are some of the tallest mountains in the world, uh, which, you know, Mount Everest, of course, in that region uh, is the tallest mountain in the world. I think it's 29,031 feet, uh, which everybody wants to, you know, go climb it uh, today. Uh, Mount Everest, and of course, a lot of people get killed uh, as well trying to climb it. Uh, so that's that's located, of course, in the Himalayas. Uh, also, they have another series of mountains you may have heard of called the Hindu Kush, which are not in India. It used to, I guess, be part of what, we, what was ancient India <clears throat> a long time ago. But the Hindu Kush mountains are mountains that are located like more like in Afghanistan in I guess, going into Pakistan. Uh, and uh, Hindu Kush were kind of important because uh, they have a lot of passes that go through it that run toward into India. Uh, also kind of like a highway system and trade system that runs that way uh, towards India. Uh, also in India, they have this thing that's called the Indo-Gangetic Plain uh, as well. Uh, what is that? Uh, it's this uh, fertile valley system of like three rivers, uh, which are really uh, the Indus, uh, the Ganga or Ganges River, and then also don't forget the Brahmaputra River is kind of thrown in it. Well, as well, uh, which is about 2,000 miles long from like Pakistan to the western part of it all the way into Bangladesh. So about 2,000 mile length of, of region going from west to east there. And um, they think that a lot of the civilization started in the western part, like along the Indus River, and then eventually spread eastward toward the Ganges River. Uh, and a lot of your empires later rule from the Ganges River Basin and not really in the Indus. But the oldest civilization that I'll get to later, Indus Valley Civilization, started along the Indus River first there. Uh, that area is kind of important, too, because uh, a lot of farming, of course, takes place there still today. And also in ancient times, that's where all farming started, of course, in India Believe it or not, there's a lot of people that live there. I think in all those three countries, I forget the number it was, population that lived there. I thought it was like 1.8 billion people live in all three of those countries combined, uh, Pakistan, India, uh, and Bangladesh. But I do know in the Indo-Gangetic Plain or in Indus-Ganges Plain, about a billion people live there uh, throughout that area. So it's a very populated area. Uh, that's in that region. So a lot of farming started there a long time ago. Of course, still most fertile, really, area farming uh, in India is right there. Uh, they also have what they call the Deccan Plateau. You see right here, uh, the Deccan Plateau is kind of this plateau region of southern India uh, that's within the pen peninsula, like the bottom of the peninsula, uh, that's kind of between the Western and Eastern Ghats, which are these mountain ranges that are kind of on the Western and Eastern sides of the peninsula. Uh, and you can see the average height uh, is about somewhere between 300 to 3,000 feet. So it's kind of this flat plateau area that's kind of high up a little bit. Uh, and um, that area is kind of important, uh, the Deccan Plateau, for several reasons. Uh, one, uh, they think that's where a lot of uh, royal dynasties of India originated from like a long time ago. Uh, the word Deccan supposedly means, uh, I think it's a Sanskritic word, meaning the south is what it means. Southern part of India, I guess, I guess what it meant. And it's also rich in a lot of minerals uh, like um, iron ore, coal, copper, limestone, I think diamonds, uh, things like that they find there a lot in abundance, bauxite, make aluminum, uh, and um, a lot of agriculture too, uh, of course, also. But it's kind of a more drier area of India, and it's not as affected by the monsoon, like the wet season, of course, uh, in, in India. Uh, that's something else I wanted to talk about too, uh, which is, you know, very famous about India. India goes through these seasons. They have the monsoon seasons that they have uh, in India uh, where they have two uh, monsoon seasons. They have what they call a wet 
monsoon season, which sometimes it's called the Southwest monsoon uh, in India. And they have also what they call a dry monsoon uh, season, which uh, sometimes called the Northwest monsoon uh, also as well, which the wet season happens in the summer, uh, which you know, usually happens most parts of Asia, Africa <clears throat> as well. Uh, and uh, if you look at this map here, uh, winds come off the uh, Indian and Arabian Sea, <clears throat> Indian Ocean, Arabian Sea uh, during the summer. Uh, you can see the wet monsoon winds typically come in with rain from about June to September. So in the summertime uh, is when this, of course, occurs. Uh, and then you can see how the winds change uh, in the winter. They have a dry monsoon winds uh, that come from the north, north, I guess, north east or northwest. I think it's northeast, I guess, what it really should be. But uh, October to May uh, is the kind of reverses and goes the opposite way uh, that it does. And uh, the monsoon season is very important. It does affect like their agriculture, uh, about 80% of the precipitation that falls during the year usually falls during the, the wet season, like in the summer. So I think typically they, they've talked about a no over the last so many years, like with climate change, that India is not getting enough rain. Uh, believe it or not, even though a lot of these monsoons uh, bring in a lot of precipitation like rain, uh, that causes a lot of flooding. Uh, you see a lot of images of that uh, where it kind of tends to, to flood a lot. So here you go, kind of looking at it again, June to September is usually the peak of it, of when it is. Uh, so it could rain for hours. It could rain for days, uh, you know, during during basically um, uh, these rainy seasons. And so a lot of cities like Mumbai, which is called Bombay or Calcutta, uh, they get most of their rain of course, uh, during uh, these wet monsoon seasons. Uh, and so, yeah, you could have deals where streets and, you know, cities are flooded uh, because of that uh, happen. So I guess we're used to that, Louisiana, where we get a lot of rain, you know, hurricanes, um, things like that. <clears throat> and um, they have the same thing like we do. They have like tropical cyclone seasons uh, also uh, that come in. Uh, during during the year, uh, although I think there are tropical cyclone seasons, uh, the peak tends to be about November to April is when they get a lot of these kind of like hurricanes uh, that we get uh, that hit India. And they usually have a few that will hit that region uh, in around India or in, in the area or hit parts of Asia. I think in Asia and Pacific, sometimes call them typhoons. Uh, also as well, but they, they sometimes get these uh, also as well, of course, that also affect uh, their their climate and their weather. Uh, I want to get into next and talk about civilization as well, because they do have like early civilizations that get started uh, in India. Of course, one of the first that comes in uh, that's famous is the Indus Valley Civilization. And uh, this was believed to be the first major civilization of ancient India, which wasn't really discovered, they think, until about the 19th century, uh, just recently, a century or so ago. And it mostly was in Pakistan is where it was, like majority of it, uh, parts of like maybe eastern Afghanistan, and then also located up in the northern part uh, of India. And uh, they do think it was a type of Bronze Age civilization uh, that probably peaked about 4,000 years ago. Uh, there's kind of a debate about when it existed, uh, all that. But usually the datings that I get is like 3300 BC. They do have some that go down to like 1300 BC, but they seem to think about 1800 or 18th century BC, uh, they start declining. Uh, as a culture, but predominantly it was a Bronze Age civilization that flourished along the Indus River Valley uh, with numerous cities that were built there uh, a long time ago, which uh, you can kind of see in that image uh, right here on the right that most of their cities uh, were mostly made of mud brick. Uh, and uh, it does have different names. Uh, you'll sometimes see it being called Harappan civilization. 
uh, because it was located, it was found originally in the 19th century uh, under the British Raj uh, near a village called Harapa. And so it got that name being used afterwards. Uh, and so the name kind of stuck. I like think 1860s, I think, was when uh, it was found. I think what was going on was the British were building a railroad through that area of Pakistan into India. They found like archaeological sites uh, where they had built these mass cities, but they don't really know a whole lot about it. I think a lot of it's just from archaeology uh, that they discovered like a long time ago. I've got other images showing, of course, the most famous. They have a bunch of these cities that were built, uh, they think, about over 4,000 years ago. Uh, Mahenjo Daro, uh, the city of Harappa, uh, those two uh, were believed to be the largest that were constructed uh, in the Bronze Age uh, around Pakistan uh, along the Indus River Valley. Uh, so they think the average, some of these larger cities uh, were 30 to 50,000, but they have found like 100 something or more uh, villages and cities up and down the river that may have existed at one point uh, in that region. And they, I think there's different debates about how large this civilization was, but it may have been close to 5 million at the most. And some people do compare, compare it to the Sumerians uh, who were, you know, in ancient uh, Iraq in Mesopotamia a long time ago. There's even been some speculation they may have traded back and forth uh, with each other uh, as well. Uh, but Mohenjo Daro, that's the one that's the, the one they always talk about the most because they've done the most. Um, excavations there uh, overall. But um, I think I think they, they estimate that one, at least they, they debate about how big it was, maybe 30,000, 30, 40,000 at the largest may have been where it was, but that's, that's the Harappa site, of course, you're looking at there. That was the first one they built first before Mohenjo-Daro. Might be a little older uh, than Mohenjo-Daro, but um, that would locate like up in the, like the northern part of Pakistan would be where it is. And then the other site, uh, which is um, Mohenjo Daro, that one's located uh, in what would be uh, the southern part of Pakistan, more down toward the lower part of the Indus River Valley. But that one's more larger uh, in size uh, that was found. I think the one, my one Harappa might be 20, 30,000 range, and this one might be more like 40, 50,000 at, at the largest overall, but not as old as the other one of Harappa. Uh, they do think they had multi um, level type buildings that were made of mud brick, which a lot of was like oven fired mud brick that they used to build a lot of these dwellings that you're looking at. And um, one thing about Mohenjo Daro, it's famous for the citadel area where they have this so called Great Bath of Mohenjo Daro uh, that was found in the 1920s. Uh, it's probably one of the most famous things about Mohenjo Daro that's kind of a mystery uh, today. Uh, and um, supposedly Mohenjo Daro is a name that meant Mound of the Dead or Hill of the Dead uh, because they have that uh, citadel that's high up. That's on top right there, you see above. Check out, I've got an image showing that right here, which that citadel area may have been used to uh, protect the city. Uh, but it has like a, a part of the city where people lived. Uh, they also have like public buildings uh, that were there uh, as well. And of course, they also had that famous bath that was there as, that, that became real known uh, today in modern times. And... Um, it's kind of a lot of debate about like what the bath was originally used for. Uh, it was found in 1926 uh, in some of the archaeological excavations uh, that were done there. And it is considered, like it says there, one of the earliest public water tanks or wa water baths that was kind of constructed throughout the world, which you do see a lot of these like in Greco-Roman baths that are, of course, built uh, all over the place in the world. And um, they think there was some kind of ritualistic uh, connection to it. They think it may have been related to early religion uh, in, in ancient India. 
because they found some kind of temple they think that was built across the street from it, uh, which uh, was, I think, called sometimes the, um, I forget what they call it, the House of Priests or the College of Priests. They sometimes nickname it. And so they think it had some kind of ritualistic purposes that were part of it, uh, so-called Great Bath of Mohenjo-Daro. Uh, how big is it? Uh, they think it's about 40 feet by 23 feet wide to kind of give you an idea of the size of it. Kind of like a swimming pool, you know, pretty much. And uh, it's only about eight feet deep. It's about how deep they think it is. So that's the so-called um, Great Bath of Mahindra-Daro. And then they got the Citadel, uh, which you're looking at here, which the Citadel is about 39 feet high or close to 40 feet high, or if you want meters, 12, 13 meters uh, in height. And so it overlooked that part of the city. But they do think that um, Hanjo Dara was divided into two areas, the Citadel, that area, where I think they, they estimate maybe 5,000 people maybe lived there, which may have been where like a more of the wealthier people lived. And then they had a lower part of the city uh, as well, where the rest of the population lived. So probably was used as part of a fortification uh, maybe a defense of the city uh, like a long time ago. Uh, here's a granary site also as well uh, that they had. Uh, so a lot of these sites like Harappa, Mahindra Daro had uh, granary sites where they stored like grain uh, all year round. Uh, but uh, a lot of these cities were pretty advanced. Uh, they had uh, not just a grid system where, you know, roads crisscrossed, on things like that, but they talk about like drainage systems, sewage systems uh, existing at one point uh, throughout a lot of these cities. Uh, they had a lot of metal work. Uh, they did uh, like copper, bronze, um, probably lead, gold, silver, things like that uh, were being used. They did have language. They had a language system that they they have that that's kind of well known today, uh, which is often called Indus script or some people call it Harapan script. And uh, Indus script was a type of uh, writing system of in ancient India that was written on mostly like seals, uh, like you see right here uh, in this image. And uh, a lot of them were put on like ceramic, pottery. Uh, some were even carved into like copper and other things like that, pottery uh, as well. And uh, it's a type of writing system that's undecipherable. Uh, it was first found in the 1870s. They think it's some kind of pre-Indo-Aryan type language system that was used in India, but they're not sure uh, how it's related uh, to later languages. Uh, there's a theory that it might be related to Dravidian, which is a type of language uh, still written and spoken in uh, in India today. Uh, but they're not sure how it's connected. But they have found several thousand of these artifacts uh, throughout India and Pakistan. Uh, but they're not sure that uh, nobody's been able to figure out like how to read it. So it's kind of like um, it's kind of like the uh, Minoan language. If you know about Minoan, uh, called Linear A, uh, they haven't been able to translate that either uh, as well. Uh, what we do know about their civilization is that it, it existed until about maybe close to about the 18th century. And then after that, it started declining uh, afterwards, which uh, the decline of the Indus Valley civilization uh, is debated. Uh, there's all kinds of theories about what caused it to actually decline. Uh, the main ones they talk about is climate change uh, has been put forth as a big thing, which they think part of it may have been because of droughts. I think there's a theory that maybe the wet monsoon season went away and not getting enough, you know, rain. That forced them to abandon their cities and things like that has been put forth uh, as a popular theory of what caused them to decline. Another theory is they got invaded, which uh, this is kind of a debated theory, which is still controversial today. Some people think they weren't invaded and they just, yeah, these uh, Indo-Aryan migrations that come in uh, to India and they kind of absorbed their culture uh, and all that. Uh, they also talk about the course of the river may have changed, uh, things like that. 
uh, could have also caused it too. If that could have been caused by climate change uh, as well. So there's different theories on what happened to their culture. I think the Indus, uh, the Indus decline has been compared sometimes with the Mayans, you know, in like uh, in America uh, about why they declined. Uh, Minoan culture too, because Minoan culture, you know, declined uh, also as well, Mysteri mysteriously, you know, that kind of thing. But uh, they abandoned their cities. Uh, it's one of the things, of course, that happened uh, over time. Uh, here's kind of, of course, the theory of what happened. They think what occurred was that they had these so-called Indo-Aryan cultures or peoples that came in uh, to India, which they think waves of them started maybe around the 18th to the 15th century. It's about when they came in uh, from the north, came down through the Hindu Kush mountains uh, into uh, Pakistan, India today. Uh, and so that that's kind of what, what changed it. Uh, to do that. Uh, they think a lot of these peoples uh, originated somewhere around where the Ukraine is. So that's the theory uh, that they have of where they come from. I think the theory is that the Caucasus Mountains, that area is maybe where the Aryan peoples originate from. It's where you get the word Caucasian that they sometimes use to describe people uh, that are the term white. I don't know why they use that term today because they're not really white. But um, but anyway, um, but they can't. They you can see they migrated to different parts of the world. So if you know, some went into Europe, uh, some went like into Turkey, uh, Central Asia, uh, and then down down into India. And so the term Aryan uh, that's more of an Indian term. It's a Sanskritic word uh, that means freeborn or noble birth. Because uh, I think later when the caste system developed in India, they kind of differentiate themselves uh, from other peoples that are there. Uh, so these were believed to be nomadic peoples uh, that were of upper class, um, you know, social standing, nobility, I guess. And so the term Aryan was used, of course, to describe that. Uh, they do break, break them down into different groups. Indo-Aryans, that's what they usually call the you know Aryans that go into India, Indo-Iranians, the ones like around Iran, Persians, the Medes, uh, the Scythians are kind of thrown into that, I guess, as groups. Uh, Hittites um, would be like groups that were kind of like going to Turkey would be Indo-Europeans, and I guess Greeks, Romans are kind of throw into like the Indo-European uh, type, you know, groups that they have later, but. All of it's based on language. Most of the, you know, Indo-European, Indo-Aryan type languages, most of them are written left to right. I think the only one that's not is Persian. It's written right to left uh, because of uh, influence from Arabic uh, later. I think Sanskrit, I'll we'll get to later, is mostly written left to right as an example. Oh, and by the way, uh, uh, Oh, let me get to one more thing about the Aryans. Of course, as you know, in modern times, uh, if you know about the Nazis, like Adolf Hitler, uh, they kind of uh, saw themselves, you know, the Germans as the Aryan race. Uh, that's something that's kind of developed in modern times. Like, I guess going back to the 19th, 20th century, not sure how they connect to, you know, people that are in India today, uh, but somehow they're all related, all these different Aryans. But uh, that was some kind of master race theory uh, that uh, some some Nazis believed that they were descended from Aryan peoples. Uh, and some may have been. They came out of, you know, where the Ukraine is now. But, um, yeah, Khyber Pass, uh, you may have heard about that. That's a famous pass uh, that runs down through the Hindu Kush, uh, which is mostly located like around Afghanistan, uh, going into Pakistan. Uh, and uh, it's about a 33 mile long pass, uh, which is very important because of trade. A lot of trade goes uh, between East and West uh, from there going into Pakistan, uh, into India. And um, it acts as a highway system. It was also used as an invasion route. Uh, so a lot of people used it to invade uh, into India, uh, like the Huns uh, did it, uh, the uh, Alexander the Great, uh, the Mongols, uh, et cetera, 
all came down through there. And they think the probably a lot of these Indo Aryans that get in India a long time ago probably came down through, of course, uh, the Khyber Pass uh, that's there now. Here's kind of an image showing you, but you can see it's kind of like a road system <clears throat> that runs down through there. Uh, mostly in Afghanistan's where it's located <clears throat> the most. <clears throat> There's Hindu Kush Mountains. That's where it's located, of course, today. It's about 33 miles long, I guess, uh, estimated length. I was trying to think some other things in there that I was talking about, uh, I did want to talk about, which are famous. Yeah, uh, some other things that are very famous, too, I wanted to mention about Sanskrit. Don't forget about that. Uh, Sanskrit. Uh, you know, is uh, one of the main things that a lot of these Indo-Aryan peoples brought into India, uh, which is a type of uh, Indo-Aryan language, which is one of the oldest in the world, uh, which dates back, I forget how old it is, but it's got to be four or 5,000 years old uh, as an actual language. So it goes back to like the late Bronze Age. Uh, and uh, Sanskrit is a very important language because a lot of the different um I guess, sacred texts, you know, of Hinduism, uh, Buddhism, Jainism, all these religions of, you know, of India a long time ago were all written uh, in that language. And a lot of your languages of India, like Hindi and other Indian dialects, are all descended from it from a long time ago, uh, Sanskrit. So that's something that the Indo-Aryans brought in a long, long time ago uh, into India. Uh, they also brought in these things uh, that are called the Veda, the Veda, uh, which the Veda are these uh, scriptures of, of, of in, in Hinduism, which are um, the basis of the whole religion of Hinduism, which I think I've got an image uh, of, of the um, Veda, uh, if I could find them, I don't know if I think where I put them in here somewhere, uh, the Veda, not sure if I got them or not, that's not it uh, right there. Uh, but um, I'm not sure where they went to uh, with the picture of the Vedas. But um, if we go back to that slide right there, it had, um, they have like four of them that they have that's that's important. Uh, the Rig Veda, you see there on the bottom, that one's the oldest one. Uh, they think it dates roughly to maybe about 1500 B.C., so maybe Three to four thousand years old is how old the Rig Veda is, and um, they also have three other ones that are famous: uh, Yajurveda, Samaveda, and also Atharvaveda uh, as well. Uh, and uh, but the Rig Veda is the one that's the most famous one. Uh, it has something like a thousand and twenty-eight hymns in it, which a lot of them were chanted. Uh, if you know about that. And uh, the belief about the Veda was that they were uh, originally oral in tradition. They were passed down. People would memorize it and pass it down. And they think sometime around 1500 B.C. or afterwards, they began to be written down, uh, which the Rig Veda might be the oldest religious text in the world. It's one of the oldest books in the world. I want to say up there with the Epic of Gilgamesh. Uh, and it's a very sacred text. It's where they get a lot of the theology of Hinduism from, a lot of stuff about their gods uh, and Hinduism uh, also, also as well. So the word Veda supposedly means in Sanskrit, it means uh, knowledge. So it was knowledge given to them uh, by, by the gods. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Hinduism. I'll kind of go into some background about it to kind of give you an idea of what Hinduism, uh, the religion itself, is about. Uh, if you look at this definition of it right here, it's, a, of course, a dominant religion of India. I told you that 80% of people in India practice it, or at least forms of, of Hinduism, which I think is different schools of it uh, in India. Uh, and it's characterized by having a lot of gods that they do have, although if you know about it, a lot of the gods are actually manifestations of the god Brahman, which Brahman is like believed to be like a type of supreme being or supreme deity uh, that Hindus think that exist. Uh, and uh, it's also connected to the caste system, which I'll probably talk about next week, about in that part two lecture I'll have later. 
Also, karma, reincarnation, uh, those are major ideas that are part of Hinduism uh, as well, uh, which do affect other similar religions uh, like Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism uh, as well. Uh, doesn't have a founder. You know, a lot of religions have founders, uh, you know, about that. Uh, but this one does not. Uh, it's a type of religion that kind of evolved uh, over hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, Hindus do call it sometimes Santa Tana Dharma, uh, which I think there's different translations of it. But supposedly it, it can mean uh, eternal way uh, or uh, eternal truth uh, because of the belief that all living things have souls and uh, the souls uh, are like eternal uh, living, you know, forever. And they, of course, they believe in the idea of reincarnation, which is a big part, of course, of a lot of these uh, Indian faiths uh, that develop, of course, in the East. Uh, it is the third uh, oldest, well, I don't know if it's the third oldest, but it's the third largest religion in the world. It's one of the oldest. I don't know if it's the third oldest, but third largest religion in the world, uh, which dates back, they think, over 4,000 years ago. Uh, estimated. Uh, with, uh, we know about it, uh, the chief religions uh, in India today, uh, besides Hinduism, which has maybe a little over a million people uh, that practice it, uh, you can see Islam, um, 212 million people practice it. And then Christianity, you can see about 33 uh, million people uh, practice it. So that's your three, top three religions uh, that are practiced in India uh, today. And it's pretty old. I mean, if you look at Hinduism, it's up there with like, I think Judaism is the oldest uh, religion probably uh, in, in the world. There might be some other ones that are older than that. Zoroastrianism is pretty old too, uh, as well. Might be the third oldest. Uh, but uh, you can see worldwide, 1.3 million people practice it uh, throughout the world uh, with Majority of them, of course, being uh, in uh, India itself. India has the most Hindus uh, worldwide. Uh, India and Nepal, though, are the only two countries uh, worldwide that are a majority Hindu. I think both have about 80% of the population uh, is Hindu, and the rest is uh, other religions uh, that, that they have. Uh, these are other countries that have Hindus in it, too, uh, as well. Bangladesh has about 14 million people that practice Hinduism. Uh, but you can see Bangladesh is mostly a Muslim country. Uh, Indonesia, a pretty populated country, one of the top five populated countries in the world, has 18 million uh, Hindus, but it's, again, majority Muslim. Pakistan's got about four and a half million um, Hindus, but again, majority uh, Muslim. Then Sri Lanka, that little island nation off the coast of India, 2.7 million practice Hinduism, but I think it's mostly Buddhist. I want to say 80% Buddhist uh, in that country that uh, they have. So it's kind of giving you an idea of the different countries that are out there. Uh, and you can see on the bottom, it did give birth to other religions, because you have some, some that kind of broke away from it. Uh, that wanted to try to find better ways, uh, especially to end reincarnation. That's one thing, of course, uh, that kind of led to that. Buddhism, the most famous, uh, Jainism, and then Sikhism, of course, also uh, broke away as well. So, yeah, there we go. Those different religions. So that, those kind of like the areas where some of these other religions, of course, are located. So you can see Christianity is more popular. Uh, in the southern part, uh, also close where Bangladesh is uh, as well. Uh, Buddhists, you see central western part of India and also the northern part of India as well. Sikhism's up in the northern part of India, close to Kashmir. And then you see Jainism, small amount, uh, probably one of the smallest, of course, uh, is in more in the western part of India, close to Pakistan. I'll talk about some of these different other religions later uh, next week. Uh, let me also talk about uh, some of the different theological ideas uh, that are based in Hinduism uh, as well. Uh, if you go to this, this is some of the kind 
kind of brief ideas that that's kind of famous in Hinduism. That's there. I, I talked about the fact that in Hinduism they have this idea of a supreme being, uh, which uh, is often called Brahman. Uh, is the term they use. Uh, and uh, Hindus sometimes talk about it being the ultimate ground of all being uh, in the universe. Brahman creates and destroys everything, like all living things, uh, you know, throughout throughout the universe. Uh, and uh, try to confuse it with Brahma. It's actually, Bra it should be Brahman, not Brahma. But Brahma is like a god that's kind of part of Brahman uh, that they have later. But it's not like the West. Uh, in the West, uh, we have this idea of, uh, that God's in heaven, that kind of thing, like God's living in heaven or whatever. Uh, but uh, to Hindus, I think Brahman is more like the whole universe is God, would be kind of what it is. And all the souls and all living things are all part of basically the whole universe, uh, maybe living in harmony with it. Uh, also, another belief uh, is that all living things have souls, which is sometimes called an Atman, uh, is a translation from the Sanskrit. Uh, and so this could be not just humans, but animals, even down to maybe insects and worms, that kind of thing might have, you know, living souls uh, that are eternal, that never die. Uh, and so uh, the belief is that uh, you would live your life like a cycle of, you know, life and death. Uh, and then you'd go through what they call reincarnation, where uh, your soul uh, would go through a rebirth uh, where you, your, your body would die and then you'd be reborn into another living thing. Uh, and so the actual cycle, which is like more like an eternal cycle, <clears throat> it could be sometimes called samsara, uh, so-called transmigration of the souls, uh, where the souls are constantly being reborn uh, into different living things over time which could be human form, but it could be some other form like an animal or whatever. Uh, they do believe that over time that the soul will be liberated uh, from this cycle of reincarnation, uh, samsara, uh, which the Hindus call it later moksha. Uh, and um, there's different theories on how to, how to stop reincarnation, uh, which I'll get to later. Karma, Dharma, those are sometimes uh, ways that, you know, can influence uh, one's soul uh, where it ends up uh, over time. Uh, but the belief is that over time, your soul should stop reincarnating and be liberated uh, and become one with Brahman. Uh, the Buddhists later call it Nirvana. Uh, Buddhists, you know, uh, try to find some kind of new method uh, that'll... Um, skip the whole cycle of reincarnation and try to do it within their lifetime. But yeah, these are things that can affect it, like karma and dharma uh, that you've probably heard of before. Karma are like deeds or actions, uh, like either within your life that can affect uh, reincarnation later. I think the word karma means actions or some say right actions, uh, but you can have bad karma. You can have good karma. Uh, and so uh, things you do in this life can affect, you know, your next life uh, later, uh, up or down uh, in the next next life. Uh, dharma is like your, your obligations, your duties, your callings, uh, you know, moral, ethical uh, things that you follow in your life. Uh, those kind of things can also affect uh, reincarnation, uh, as well. Uh, in fact, in Buddhism, they talk about the eight dharma, the dharma wheel, you know, how that can affect, of course, if you can end reincarnation uh, or not. But uh, other things can affect it too, like prayer, meditation, uh, you know, yoga was something that, you know, the Hindus invented uh, as well. Uh, so there's kind of a debate about how uh, to end reincarnation. And so that's what gave birth really to uh, what led to other movements like Buddhism taking off, which Buddhism took off about 2,500 years ago because uh, of Siddhartha Buddha or Siddhartha Gautama, they sometimes call him as well. Uh, he started this movement uh, to kind of, uh, you know, fight, I guess, what Hen traditional Hindus was doing 
Uh, and so he came up with his own teachings. He thought that would lead to uh, ending reincarnation, uh, which he called it nir nirvana or nibbana uh, as well. Uh, that's pretty much my lec part one lecture today. I'll kind of uh, next week I'll continue uh, talking about uh, some other aspects. I'll kind of talk more about Hinduism. I haven't had time to talk about everything about Hinduism, but I'll talk about the caste system uh, that they think was developed uh, within Hinduism, which divided people into different social classes. I'll talk about also, um, I'll get into like talking about the different gods. I haven't really got that yet, but I've, I've kind of just, you know, discussed the different gods, the famous gods anyway, uh, which are in Hinduism. Then I'll get to the other ones like Buddhism. I'll talk about Jainism uh, as well. Then I'll also probably get into talk about some of the different famous states that were in ancient India. I'll probably just mostly talk about the empires. Those are the ones that kind of unified India. That's primarily what I usually do. Uh, that'll be mostly what I'll talk about India overall. So I'll have a quiz later, uh, like an assessment coming up on India probably next week. Uh, like I said, this is kind of a short week, uh, of course, uh, this semester or this week. Uh, so, yeah, I'll have a part two lecture probably, I want to say, next next Monday uh, I'll have. But reminders coming up, uh, don't forget uh, the uh, quiz on uh, Egypt, that first exam I put online, uh, that'll be Probably do, I want to say Friday. I'll give you a few more days for those that have not done that assessment yet. Uh, so that's that's still up uh, in quizzes. And then don't forget, I've also got that quiz on the Phoenician Israelites lectures, which that'll probably do sometime next week uh, coming up as well. So those are some of those reminders about different assignments that I've got out there uh, for y'all to, of course, to take, take a look at. I uh, did have a few other students that came in late. Looks like Jeremiah joined us. Hey, good morning, uh, Jeremiah, uh, along with Kelsey. Looks like Samantha also joined us uh, as well. And then Kayla was also joining us as well. So I hope everybody had a great Mardi Gras week, weekend and all that week, of course. Um, next week, you know, it's a short week pretty much, uh, you know, but next week I'll wrap up, like I said, I'll wrap up India, and I'm going to move on also to talk about uh, ancient China, because uh, we are kind of moving along in this semester. I'm trying to, you know, get towards, I guess, ancient Greece would be the next thing I'll get to eventually, Greece and Rome. Uh, and so uh, that's pretty much the schedule I've got coming up in uh, the rest, rest of the semester. But I'll keep sending out announcements, of course, uh, emails uh, about, about different things uh, with the class. But if you have a comment about about you know any administrative thing, do email me, of course, uh, at at my email address. And don't forget, you can leave comments, questions, of course, uh, either on my YouTube channel or also in uh, Canvas discussions. So short week this week, like I said, uh, but I'll see you, of course, next week with the part two lecture, of course, on India. So y'all have a great rest of the week, even though it's short. <laughs> so y'all y'all take y'all take care. <laughs>